Yeah, sure. We've cast the X-Men and even made a video about how to adapt some of their stories, but you know what we have not talked about at all that will matter more than any of that? When Disney makes their first X-Men movie, who should they hire to direct it? This may be the single most important personnel pick in the entire process. The director is going to be responsible for bringing everything together, getting great performances out of the actors, building a memorable visual style for the team, and just overall dictating the feel of this movie. And I'm sure some of you are saying, well, the Marvel directors don't make a difference because all Marvel movies feel the same. There's a big difference between Iron Man, Ragnarok, Eternals, Guardians, Multiverse of Madness, and Avengers, right? That is the difference between Favreau, Waititi, Zhao, Gunn, Raimi, and Whedon. The director matters. I mean, look at the X-Men movies. There's a huge difference between Singer, Vaughn, Mangold, and Ratner. There are different ways to play this. And because this movie is such a high priority, I just can't see Disney not going with a proven talent, someone with vision who has helmed, if not a big franchise picture before, at least a movie we've heard of. And that narrows the list down significantly. So let's look at some of our options. I'm going to go over five directors or directing pairs who I think could do this. This list is not just going to be the Daniels and guys like that. However, I do appreciate that one of you told the Daniels about my movie idea where we get all the Daniels together, like Kaluuya, Day Lewis, Craig, and then they can direct a movie about what it means to be a Daniel. I mean, really, I'd love for a second that they knew I existed. And also, I mean, if the Daniels wanted to, they'd probably be great X-Men directors, but I just don't think that's realistic. But no, I think there's a very good shot that all five of these directors or directing pairs are in the running. Like, they are the people that Marvel would call for this, and they're the people who might say yes. I'll talk about their history, their strengths, their weaknesses, and at the end, I will pick who I think should direct the first MCU X-Men movie. Also, my opinion counts for nothing and does not matter, but also... Let's treat it like it does. Isn't that what the internet is for? You may be wondering, what kind of X-Men movie are we talking about here? Great question. Is it going to be like the originals, focused mainly on the adults, or the reboots, focused mainly on the kids? I think the answer is both. I'm betting the first X-Men movie is going to be something like Night of the Sentinels. A young mutant gets introduced to a team that already exists featuring mutants in their 20s and 30s. So sort of like X-1, except instead of focus immediately switching from Rogue to Wolverine, the kid would remain the main character. So all that out of the way. Let's get to some directors. And I want to start with three who I think would be incredible, but almost certainly would never do it. Like Jordan Peele. One of the most exciting directors of the current generation, able to mix genres and complex themes into crowd-pleasing blockbusters. Peele tells stories that use science fiction to highlight social issues, and if that is not the mission statement of the X-Men, I don't know what is. And I'm not just talking about big sci-fi movies like Nope. Peele also wrote and produced the reboot of The Twilight Zone. He also produced Lovecraft Country. And if you go back to his Key and Peele days, so many of the sketches borrow from sci-fi tropes or just riff on sci-fi movies. He even did a sketch as an 80-year-old Stan Lee pitching terrible new superheroes. Jordan Peele loves sci-fi. Then yet, Jordan Peele does not direct other people's projects. He's been very clear about only wanting to put effort into directing stories he has written. Specifically, speaking to Rolling Stone about directing a big franchise, Peele said, quote, So many of those properties. It's a childhood dream to be able to essentially see what you saw in your imagination as a child, watching or reading or whatever you were doing with that stuff, he said. It's a filmmaker's dream. But, you know, I feel like you only have so much time. I have a lot of stories to tell, and it just doesn't feel right. So even though Jordan Peele might be the best possible pick for an X-Men movie, he does not seem to want to do it, and I get it. I love to know, keep doing your thing. Then we've got another director I would love to see do this, but almost certainly will not. Edgar Wright is probably my favorite filmmaker. I know, such a bold, I went to film school in 2007 choice. But he's just my most watchable director. It's so easy to go back and fall in love with Hot Fuzz or Baby Driver minus some of the actors. And even when he makes a movie that isn't very good like Last Night in Soho, it's still a joy to watch. And Wright has a very specific visual style that could work so well for X-Men movies. Just imagine it all translated into live action with the same energy as Scott Pilgrim. Big, bold power signatures bouncing across the screen. That fight with the Katayanagi twins is exactly what I expect from two psychics dueling. The fight with Lee is what multiple men should feel like. Matt Patel is sort of Gambit. Roxy is Nightcrawler, she even gets a Banff. And then Todd is any of the telepaths, or Magneto, or really Havoc with the circles. It's perfect. However, Edgar Wright is probably not going to be working for Marvel Studios anytime soon. You see, back, 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 way back in 2003 when artists and entertainment who held the rights to Ant-Man was planning to make their own Ant-Man movie, Edgar Wright wrote a script. Everything eventually shuffled over to Marvel, and when Feige 
Feige asked Wright if he wanted to be involved in the creation of Marvel Studios, Wright volunteered to make an Ant-Man movie with the script he'd written in 2003. This was all announced in 2006. Keep in mind, Ant-Man does not come out until 2015. Schedules clashed for a while, Wright took some time to finish the Cornetto trilogy, but eventually it was time for Ant-Man. And then Marvel took Edgar Wright's original script, which according to people who've read the script was terrific, and Marvel made their own edits without Wright's knowledge, and the resulting script was so generic that Edgar Wright dropped out then and there. And some of the story is not 100% confirmed, but this definitely is something like what happened. So, I don't think Edgar Wright has sworn off of comic book movies, but I'd venture a guess he's not psyched to work with Marvel again anytime soon. And then a third director who I think would crush this, James Gunn. The man does not miss. He loves comics and makes great Marvel movies. I don't know what else I need to say. Guardians 3 might be my favorite Marvel movie since Endgame. But James Gunn is busy. He's got a lot of DC on his plate, so this one is not realistic either. So those are the three who would crush it, but for one reason or another just don't seem interested. Let's get to the directors who I could actually see directing this project. Starting with Noah Hawley. Okay, this is perhaps the easiest pick for me. If you're not familiar, Noah is the creator slash writer slash director of FX's Fargo, which from what I've seen and heard is good. I watched the first season. I liked it. But also more importantly for this conversation, Hawley is the creator, writer, director of Legion. And Legion happens to be one of the best live action X-Men things. Legion tells the story of David Heller, a schizophrenic man with the ability to warp reality. David discovers he's the son of the X-Men leader and certified jerk Professor Xavier, then he does some dancing and beats up the Shadow King. Hawley was attached to some other projects that never saw the light of day, he was set to direct the next Star Trek film but that fell through, and then it was announced that Hawley was going to make a Doctor Doom movie for Fox right before the merger pretty much destroyed any of those plans. Right now Hawley's working on an Alien series for FX, but depending on the time frame, he could be a great candidate to direct an X-Men movie. Strengths. Legion was one of those shows about a bunch of wacky, messed up guys coming together to help each other out, and that is very X-Men. If Hawley manages an ensemble like Legion well, you'd assume he could do the same with the much less complex X-Men. Legion was also thoroughly weird. The show did not try to ground these characters like some of the other live-action X-Men movies have. Hawley used wild camera work to sell the warping of reality and just overall kept everything pretty strange and interesting. I really think this could help sell the X-Men as a new thing, perhaps a dangerous thing one society could naturally hate and fear. Legion also did a solid job when it came to portraying some of these mutant powers. And these are not the easy ones like laser vision or flight. These guys were doing fights in the astral plane and switching bodies. And then yeah, there was one guy who threw rocks. Getting a director who is comfortable working with big flashy powers is a must for the X-Men, and Legion is very good experience. Although maybe it's easier than you'd expect. After all, the director of Nomadland did super speed better than anyone up until that point, so maybe it is just a really good second unit director, who knows. And I think we need a director who's not afraid of the X-Men using their powers, because I think the X-Men need to use their powers casually. Like in X2, where Bobby very heterosexually blows on the root beer bottle to cool it down. Stuff like that. Mutants using their powers in mundane ways is one thing that separates the X-Men from the Avengers. One of the biggest strengths is that Hawley seems to really want to do this. As recently as 2018, he was on the hook to direct a Doctor Doom solo movie, which, yes please. But either way, this proves that Hawley would like to adapt a comic book story for a big studio. That's not something you can definitely say about the rest of these guys. Liabilities. Holly seems like he might be busy. He's working on an alien show in the near future, and a series like that takes a lot of time and energy. I imagine we're going to be looking for someone who can make X-Men their top priority. Also, Legion focused very heavily on horror, and I don't think that's all Holly can do, but it does explain why Doom was the project he was set to direct. In the comics, Doctor Doom leads a rebellion and then goes to hell to save his mom. That is supposed to be gritty and ultra serious. The X-Men will probably have a more light tone in their first movie, so I'm curious if Hawley can manage that kind of story. So in conclusion, I do think Hawley is a great place to start because he feels super plausible and at least mildly interested. And I do believe he would do a great job, but I think there are some other names on this list that make more sense. Next up, Matthew Vaughn. Another no-brainer. Matthew Vaughn is one of my favorite working directors. He got his start working with his friend Guy Ritchie. Is credited as a producer on Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch, and Swept Away, and then Vaughn made Layer Cake and immediately caught the attention of Hollywood. And this is where his complicated relationship with the X-Men began. Vaughn was on the hook to direct X-Men The Last Stand until weeks before production started, and honestly, this is one of the big missed opportunities of X-Media. Last Stand was a mess, and while I don't know for a fact that Matthew Vaughn's version would be better put together, I can see how his style and voice may have given Last Stand more of an identity. And Last Stand sort of sunk the Gen 1 X-Men, which is a shame because the X-Men movie's big 
biggest problem has always been its inability to make enough good movies in a row to keep a continuity going long enough to justify the weirder stories. The X-Men should be going to the Savage Land and space and all kinds of alternate dimensions, but these movies could never start there. They needed to start simple and build out. But every time they got some momentum, the movies face planted and we were forced to start from scratch. So maybe a Matthew Vaughn X-Men The Last Stand could have worked and that could have kept the universe going. We'll never know. And after making Stardust and Kick-Ass, Vaughn returned to Fox Marvel to head up their reboot of the X-Men series. Vaughn was set to create a new trilogy starting with First Class and ending with Days of Future Past. And First Class was a huge hit. It is some people's favorite X-Men movie and well it should be. It's terrific. But then Fox got a little greedy and decided to rush to Days of Future Past immediately after First Class. Vaughn was not on the same page. He wanted to tell more stories with Banshee and Havoc and Emma, but Fox wanted their Avengers, so we got Days of Future Past directed by Brian Singer. And it's fine, there's plenty of good stuff there, but it's clear that a movie between First Class and Days of Future Past would have made that past timeline feel like less of an afterthought. Vaughn went on to make three movies in the Kingsman franchise, one of which is good, and by good I mean near perfect, and he's currently got a few more projects on the burner including Argyle, a spy thriller for a streaming service, so god please not another Red Notice or Ghosted or Citadel. Strengths. So it's a civil one here. Matthew Vaughn has already made a great X-Men origin movie. And the studio, a different studio, kind of screwed him over, but Vaughn clearly likes these characters and I'm sure he has some ideas for where he'd like to see a new X-Men trilogy go. He also has an undeniable visual style. It's why I hate Kingsman 2 as much as I do, and it's a lot. I cannot deny that some of those action scenes are phenomenal. They're incredibly ambitious and fun. It feels like Favreau with Iron Man. Vaughn gets how scary and important mutant powers can be, like Singer did, but he also understands that getting them is every kid's dream. So Vaughn could inject that spirit into the action sequences and make this feel immediately different from most of the X-Men movies before it. On top of that, Vaughn is great at adapting existing works. Layer Cake was a book, Stardust was a book, Kingsman, Kick-Ass, X-Men, all existing material. And like with Kingsman 1, Vaughn is able to reshape the original material fit it into a new medium, modernize certain aspects of the stories. It's not all about just doing the comic pages, but in a movie, Vaughn captures the spirit of the originals. One other thing, Vaughn has a couple of frequent collaborators that might fit well in the X-Men side of the MCU. You've got his Eggsy, Taron Egerton, who I think would make a solid Cyclops and maybe Wolverine, but probably Cyclops. And then you've got Mark Strong, who I know a lot of people like for Xavier because he's bald, but I could see him turning in a great villain performance like a Striker or a Sinister. Liabilities. The biggest liability I could see here is that he's just been through the machine and come out on the other side. Fox X-Men screwed him over in favor of rushing to their Avengers event movie with the director who has problems. And Singer killed many of the characters Vaughn introduced off screen. So yeah, I would get it if Matthew Vaughn never wanted to touch the X-Men again. And he's doing quite well. Vaughn has made multiple hits since First Class. He directed The Kingsmans and produced all those Terran Egerton biopics. Like, there's quite a few. You got Eddie the Eagle, Rocket Man, and Tetris. All movies I quite like. Vaughn doesn't need this. However, I think he would be an excellent fit and has unique expertise that could shepherd these beloved characters into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I love Matthew Vaughn, but my main issue is I just don't know if this is worth his time. Especially since there are rumors that Vaughn will direct DC's Authority movie, and I think that might be for the best. It might be good to get some new blood into the mix here. The Duffer Brothers. You've seen Stranger Things, right? It's them. I, like most of you, had never heard of the Duffer Brothers before the first season of Stranger Things. Apparently, twins Matt and Ross Duffer made their own low-budget minimalist horror film called Hidden, which told the story of a family hiding in a bunker after an apocalyptic event. They then went on to adapt the Wayward Pines books into a TV series. It was about some sort of, um... God, what was that show about? Like, I watched the first season. Okay. Matt Dillon was a cop, and he was in a like a fake village, like a Truman show, and they were vampires, and then he had to stay in the village, or the vampires would get him. It sounds like I'm describing the village, and it was produced by M. Night Shyamalan, so, you know, it feels like it. Okay, I looked it up. I was close. Cop gets caught in a Truman show sort of society where everyone is hiding from vampire mutants, and, big twist, it's the year 4000. This show itself was fine. 
So then the Duffer Brothers made a third thing about mutant monster guys that roam an apocalyptic wasteland, only this time the wasteland was another dimension and the real dimension was Spielberg 80s. And Stranger Things was a humongous hit. It basically jump-started the kid horror genre and brought Dungeons and Dragons back into the public consciousness. It is Netflix's most watched series with over a billion hours and it's about to wrap up its final season. So these guys are about to be very free. Are the Duffers the right men to direct Marvel's Merry Mutants? Strengths. Okay, so if we're doing kid X-Men, like the second generation of movies, this is very similar to what the Duffers already did with Stranger Things. Eleven is basically a mutant, and at one point it seems like they were just going to do X-Men with her and the other number kids, so this could be a very natural fit for the Duffers. Stranger Things is also able to balance the ensemble cast particularly well, a must for a good X-Men story. While not every plotline is equally interesting, cough cough California, the characters are all well defined and interact naturally together. They feel like people who really know each other. And those relationships have evolved over time, so navigating that can be difficult and the Duffers did a great job. Weaknesses. My big one here is the question of would they, and more importantly, would Netflix let them? The Duffer Brothers are the biggest creative name Netflix has produced. Like sure, Ryan Murphy makes 50 shows a year for Netflix, but Murphy was big before Netflix. Even though they've technically worked before, most people know the Duffer Brothers as Netflix guys. So can Netflix afford to lose them? The brand is shaky enough as it is. Also, the Duffers tend to skew towards horror. And while that can be what the X-Men do, like a New Mutants kind of story, I don't think that's what the main X-Men movies should be. I think they should be a little lighter. My thing with the Duffer Brothers is that I just don't think Netflix will let them go. They are too valuable and losing them would be too much of a mark against Netflix, so I have a feeling Netflix is going to give them unlimited money to stay. Daily and Goldstein. Hey, you guys remember 2000's Dungeons and Dragons the movie? A movie so boring not even Ozymandias level Jeremy Irons ham could save it? Well, they made a new one and it's pretty great, and it's sort of a great X-Men movie. But who's they? Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves was directed by John Francis Daly and Joshua Goldstein. Let's do Daly first. He's this guy, from Waiting. But he does other stuff too. Works as part of a writing, producing, directing pair with Joshua Goldstein. They wrote the screenplay for Horrible Bosses, the Vacation remake, and, uh, hold on a second, they wrote Spider-Man Homecoming? Yeah, apparently even though six people, including Daly and Goldstein, have screenplay by credits, only Daly and Goldstein have screen story by credits. So yeah, they're behind the very successful MCU Spider-Man reboot. Daly and Goldstein also directed the super popular Game Night, and then they went on to write and direct Dungeons & Dragons, a movie that is very solid. Currently, the pair have some projects on the horizon. They're rebooting Mask, writing a parody of The Six Million Dollar Man, and a sequel to their comedy Vacation Friends. But after the critical success of Dungeons & Dragons, a lot of people see potential for the pair to helm another franchise. Strengths. The word here is tone. Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves struck the perfect tone between characters that might as well have been from different movies. The main party consisted of two sarcastic guys who would feel like your average Marvel protagonists, a pair of warrior women played completely straight, and then a character perfectly balanced between sincere hero and parody. And they all fit together without stepping on each other's toes. They all felt like they belonged in this universe. I mean, these guys basically just did a Guardians of the Galaxy. You get sarcastic music guy, warrior woman, magic weirdo, nature monster, and tough guy who doesn't get sarcasm. They team up to save the world from particle effects. There's even a scene where the music guy tells everyone how much they all suck. And there's even a scene where they use music to distract the bad guys. But this did not feel like ripping off the Guardians. These guys made their own thing. But it worked in many of the same ways, and while the Guardians are not the X-Men, they're both ensemble superhero groups filled with unrelated outcasts with all kinds of abilities working together as a family. Speaking of abilities, Honor Among Thieves also manages to do pretty much everything you want with superpowers. Characters use them as if they've been using them their entire lives. And the movie doesn't feel like it needs to explain much of it to the audience. Yep, she can shapeshift, he can do some magic stuff sometimes. When it's really confusing, they do explain it. And when it breaks, you understand why. But besides that, Honor Among Thieves makes it clear you don't need much more information. You're just there to have fun. And they're all shot in really entertaining ways. The wonder of Doric escaping the castle is fantastic, peak superhero cinema. In fact, a tweet about that scene got me interested in making this video. Every X-Men should be that fun to watch, using their powers creatively in a million different ways, solving problems, changing strategies. Most X-Men can single-handedly take out a small army. Scenes like this sell us on how much they can do. I mean, has there ever been a more inventive portal scene put to film? 
They do a bit where to distract from the portal falling off the cart, the characters on the other side of the portal pretend to bone. It is fabulous. It just, it doesn't get any better than this. And let's not forget the fight choreography, also top notch. Zank vs. Gorg might be the best Don John Wick one-on-one -on -one fight of the year. It's so slick, and it showcases the differences in their skill sets and styles. You throw all these together, you've got X-Men scenes worthy of these characters. Also, these guys have already worked with two of the actors I fan casted in the X-Men video. You got Regis Jean Page, my Angel, and Justice Smith, my Iceman. Pine is a workable Cyclops, Lilis is a solid younger Jean, and then the Game Night cast brings in Billy Magnuson, another Cyclops candidate, Rachel McAdams could be an interesting Emma Frost, yes I know she's already in the MCU, but whatever. A lot of their collaborators could work in the X-Men. Liabilities. I guess their biggest liability is they just don't have as much blockbuster experience as guys like Vaughn, but besides that, I think they're maybe the best pick. In the spot Marvel likes too, on the rise, able to make a fun ensemble movie, I would be shocked if they are not in the conversation. In conclusion, I love Daly and Goldstein for this, and honestly, they would be my number one if it weren't for another slightly more plausible option. Nia DaCosta. Okay, so this one is tricky, since the thing that is going to make or break the case for Nia is not out yet, but I think we can still look at her as a serious contender. Nia DaCosta was a young filmmaker who created a Kickstarter to fund a short film called Little Woods, starring a pre-Creed Tessa Thompson. The short film got enough acclaim to justify a feature-length version of Little Woods with a cast including Thompson, Lily James, and the late Lance Reddick. Little Woods tells the story of two sisters absolutely going through it after their mother dies, about the effect poverty has on these women and how they need to work together to survive. Little Woods got the attention of Jordan Peele, who was working on a spiritual sequel to the 1992 horror classic Candyman, and shortly after Peele signed on to produce the project, DaCosta was chosen to direct. Candyman was ambitious, telling a new version of the Candyman story that built on the original and recontextualized the character for the modern audience. It holds a strong 84 in Rotten Tomatoes, and the vibe I get from people is that it's not perfect, but it's way more good than bad. And apparently it was good enough for Kevin Feige to trust Acosta with a couple hundred million dollar sequel to Captain Marvel slash Miss Marvel slash kind of WandaVision, and that's where we are right now. Marvels has not been released yet, so we don't know how well DaCosta works with the Marvel machine, but it's a promising start for a director who is, checks notes, 33, god damn it she's younger than I am, strengths. Candyman is about as close to Jordan Peele as we can get without Peele himself actually directing talking about social issues using sci-fi conventions. Candyman is very X-Men. And clearly, if DaCosta is directing Marvels, she's open to making comic book movies. Speaking of that, when she originally met with Marvel, the meeting that would eventually get her the directing role on Marvels, I'm going to say the word Marvel a lot, DaCosta actually pitched something different, according to a Guardian interview. The Miss Marvel character was already a favorite of DaCosta's. I was like, oh, this is me in high school. I really related to her nerdiness and being awkward. By her own admission, DaCosta is a huge comic book nerd. In fact, at her first meeting with her Marvel producer, Mary Lovanos, DaCosta almost put her off with her enthusiasm. I just nerded out, she says. I was like, here are the movies I think you should do. Galactus, Storm and Scott Summers team up movie, blah, blah, blah. She just endured me going in super deep. And she also gave me a lot of confidence that I would have the creative latitude to not just basically be a puppet on a string. So she wants to make a movie with the X-Men, and they're coming, eventually. So I would wager, if Marvel's works, DaCosta is the favorite for an X-Men movie, the same way the Russos did Cap and then Infinity War, or Shackman did WandaVision and then Fantastic Four. Marvel likes to promote in-house. And also, those two characters, Scott Summers and Storm, are the two that I think should be Marvel's highest priorities. Wolverine, Magneto, Jean Grey, Nightcrawler, they're easy. And the old movies, Gen 1 and Gen 2, did a solid job bringing what is interesting and fun about those characters from the comics to the screen. The movies did them justice. But Scott and Storm? Gen 1 Scott was a huge missed opportunity. James Marsden was excellent casting, but it certainly felt like any time that would have gone to developing his character was gobbled up by Wolverine. Which sure, Jackman was great, but Scott is the leader of the X-Men. It would be like if the Avengers movies never really did anything with Captain America. The team would feel so empty. And if you don't think Scott can be interesting, I've got decades of comics that you should read. And then Gen 2 Scott, listen, Apocalypse was bad, Dark Phoenix was fine, but the movies just never gave him anything new to do. And sure, Storm was clearly better represented in the Gen 1 movies, she had plenty of moments to shine, but A, she forgot her accent in the second movie, and with it seemed to go everything that made Storm unique. Like, if you could just believably sub in Iceman or Beast and give them all of Storm's lines and the scenes don't really change, we're not doing Storm right. And B, sure she was powerful, but that was not nearly powerful enough. Storm is an Omega-level mutant. 
and her biggest movie feat was making some cyclones. I mean, it's cool, but Storm should be given moments like Wanda in Endgame where she absolutely wrecks shop. And she's also an incredibly skilled hand-to-hand fighter, and she's a great leader. But in movie three, where she actually becomes the team leader and gets some space to do some cool stuff, oh look, it's Wolverine again, never mind Storm. And just like Scott, Storm was okay in the Gen 2 movies, but not good enough. The fact that DaCosta named those two characters specifically shows me that she gets it. She understands how special they are, and what they can be. And this is what we really need here. More than someone who can choreograph incredible fight scenes or visualize cool powers, we need someone who understands why we love these characters. That's why James Gunn is so special. He loved the comics and the characters and understood their potential. I don't know if Nia is big on comics or she watched the shows or movies or played the games, doesn't matter. If I could make a litmus test for these guys, I would ask them which two X-Men, not counting Kitty of course, they think we need to give the most attention in these movies and Scott Summers and Storm are the right answer. Liabilities. Like I said, we have not seen the Marvels. Sure, it's solid trailer, but you know what else had a solid trailer? So, we will see. But if Marvel's bombs, even if it's not Nia's fault, I doubt she'll get another shot with a bigger franchise. If it's fine, I think she's still in the running. If it's great, I think it's a lock. But this year, you know, anything is possible. We've got what are debatably the best and worst Marvel movies of the last decade. So who knows how good Marvels will be. So yeah, if the Marvels is a hit, I believe Nia DaCosta is a shoe-in to direct the first MCU X-Men movie if she wants it. Now, whoever ends up working on this movie is definitely going to need some caffeine. So I'd love to recommend this video sponsor, Trade Coffee. Man, Trade Coffee is so cool. If you're like me and you enjoy coffee, you probably find yourself drinking the same kinds of coffee over and over again, especially I brew my own cold brew at home. I brew it every couple of days of a new pitcher. It can be hard to expand your horizon, you know, get new kinds of coffee into the mix. That's what's so cool about Trade Coffee. They've got an algorithm that will recommend you different roasts of coffee by different independent brewers all over the country. So for instance, shows up in your house, this red bag. This one showed up for me. Haven't opened it yet. This is we're opening it on camera, so I better do it right this first time. This this is Atomic Coffee Roasters Space Cadet. It is apparently great for cold brew, which is perfect because that's how I like my coffee. So like right now, I'm gonna go grind these beans, put them in my cold brew pitcher, and then in 13 hours, I will be back to tell you what I thought of it. I, I'm very. You guys have no idea. I'm very excited. This is gonna be fun. All right, it is the next day. As you can see, different shirt, slightly different facial hair. Anyway, I have the coffee. I put it in this Eternals mug that DJ got me from Disney World. I've never used it before. This is the inaugural voyage of the mug. And now the moment of truth. It's good. This is a nice cup of coffee. They have over 55 independent roasters making their coffee. And each bag of coffee is shipped to you within 48 hours of it being roasted. So it's as fresh as you can get. And it's just easy. The subscription service is easy. It's a nice way to get fresh coffee delivered to your house or apartment. And sometimes it's things you never would have tried before, but you're probably going to like. Upgrade your morning routine with better coffee. And right now, Trade is offering our viewers a free bag of coffee with any subscription. Go to drinktrade.com slash Nando. That's drinktrade.com slash Nando for a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. Look at all the Eternals. So many Eternals. This one is um, Kingo. Kingo. Where's Makari? She's cool. Macari, we all love Macari. Drinktrade.com slash Nando. As always, I have to give a humongous thank you to everyone who continues to support the channel on Patreon, everybody that watches these videos early and ad-free on Nebula, everybody that listens to my podcast, mostly nitpicking, and everybody that follows me on Twitter, or Instagram, TikTok, all that stuff. I'm Nando V Movies on all those platforms. That's all I got. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.